So as we meet together as a church this morning, we're going to continue our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. We move into to chapter 5, which is the last chapter of the book. And so for those of you who might know me, or those of you who even have heard one single sermon, you know that I absolutely love a good story. It doesn't matter if it's a book or if it's a movie. When things begin to get dark, when things become pretty much hopeless, I'm right there. I love to watch and I love to rewatch those moments when just all seems lost, all seems broken. And yet the heroes, those, the heroes of the story, they, they just kind of kind of find hope to continue. They realize that no matter how dark it is, no matter what's going on, that at some point in time the sun's going to shine again. I think to me these are, these are kind of the most important and I think the most rewarding points within the framework of a, of a movie or a story. And I don't think I'm the only one who enjoys these scenes. I think there's a reason that uh, if you're in a movie theater, there's times where just everybody in the, the movie theater will stand up and cheer. So I don't know how many times Lonnie's come home on just numerous occasions to watch me watching some of my favorite movie scenes on YouTube. It might be whether it's William Wallace's speeches in Braveheart or The Ride of the Rohirrim in Lord of the Rings. No matter which one I'm watching, it, it just kind of gets you pumped up. It gets the blood flowing. And it's that hope. It's that chance to watch something that meet the odds that just kind of drives you. And as human beings, I think we all have kind of this ingrained sense to want to hope. We want to see David beat Goliath. We want to see, in many cases, the good guy win in the end. And this sense of hope, this ingrained sense of hope, it can be both a benefit and I think it can be a curse. I'm going to start with a curse. It can be a curse because hope and assurance are, are things that can be placed not in the right thing, but in the wrong thing. As Americans, we can place our hope in wealth. We can place our hope or assurance in education. We can place it in health or in science. If I have enough money or if I stay in just good enough shape, if I do this or this, then I'm going to be pretty much protected from anything that's going to come. But hope can be a benefit. When we place it in something that actually can survive and win in those hard and difficult times. So as Christians, we understand that we can place our hope not in ourselves. We place it solely in Christ. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what good or bad things begin to happen, we can rest assured that one day Christ will return. It's an absolute. He's going to come again, and on that day, he's going to make all things new. He's going to bring all things back to the way that they once were. Evil will be destroyed. Sin will be vanquished. And his children will forever be in a right relationship with their Father. And so as we, as we move through 1 Thessalonians for the past couple months, we kind of come to the section the past couple weeks where Paul does kind of most of his teaching. After much hardship, we remember that Paul and Silas had sent their co-worker Timothy back to the church to see just how they were doing. Upon his return, Paul and his co-workers, they were just incredibly grateful at all that God had accomplished in this body of believers while they were gone. Through all the strife that they were facing, this gives not only the church in Thessalonica, but also Paul and Silas and Timothy, just this glorious hope. And so while much of what was going on was going well as we read, the church also had a few important questions to ask the apostles. So last week, Pastor Andrew took us through one of those most important of questions. He took us through the end of chapter 4 as we kind of understood the relationships with, with those Christians who had died and that of the second coming of Christ. And so this morning, we're going to answer one of the next questions that the Thessalonian church has for the Apostle Paul. What's going to happen to those who are left, to those who are alive at the time of the day of the Lord? 
And so as we kind of begin our passage this morning, 1 Thessalonians, as we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11, just like last week, this is a passage that's going to give us a great amount of hope. It's going to give us a great and immense encouragement and assurance. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter what trials and temptations and even persecution that we're facing, Christ is there. He sees it. He knows it. And ultimately, one day in the future, he's going to rectify it. He's going to drive away the darkness. He's going to defeat and destroy death and evil forever. And so our passage is yet again hopeful in that while God will crush out the darkness, he's also made sure that there's light in the world. Through all of our sin and all of our weakness, beyond even our wildest dreams, he has called his children to himself. Even though we deserve this wrath, through the precious blood of his son, he has given us some salvation. And that is more than an encouraging thought. And so before we begin our study of, of our passage this morning, it would probably be good for us to actually read it. So open with your Bibles for, for me, and we're going we're to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to begin to read, reading in verse 1 down through 11 together. So about the time and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, like labor pans on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark, for the state has surprised you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love in a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as you are already doing. This was we just read. Paul begins this section of Scripture in verse 1 of chapter 5. And so what about these things are still around when Christ comes back? How will we be ready? So in this verse, he begins to answer these questions of the, of the church in, in kind of a simple way. He and his companions have already taught them all they need to know about the day of the Lord. About the times and the seasons, Paul begins, brothers and sisters. You do not need anything written to you. So this is, as we said, this is already something that had been taught to them just in that simple short time that Paul and his co-workers had been with the church. In his answer, Paul doesn't simply give them anything new. He doesn't give them a list of times or a list of dates. He doesn't kind of try to, try to give them this, this, this chart or this map to kind of figure out what the end of the, is going to look like. And so what does Paul actually say? So instead of giving them this, this kind of more information, he instead gives them something a little bit different. He gives them pastoral care. And so Paul begins to teach them how this information, the information that they already know, how that should be at work in their lives, not just in the future, but on a daily basis. He gives them hope that no matter what is happening on earth, no matter what persecution they may be facing, as I said before, God both sees and he knows. Through all the cries of how long, O Lord, as we read in the Old Testament, they're going to be vindicated just like the prophets and the people of old. And so Paul begins this training 
as we move into verse 2, when he begins to teach them what this day of the Lord is actually going to start to look like. So in this verse, along with the passages that we're soon going to read, we must understand the Bible does not pull its punches. So as believers, as those who understand the glory and we understand the wonder of the second coming, I think it sometimes jades us just a, just a bit in how we view the second coming. It's not a bad thing, but we begin to see it this day as we should, as a wonderful day when we're going to be with Christ forever. It's absolutely and utterly true. I'm not, seeing, not saying that we need to change our minds at all, because this is actually our greatest hope. It's what just what we're striving for. It's what drives us on all through our lives. But what we don't see, and sometimes kind of slips our minds, is the other side of the day of the Lord. It's that side that shows God's wrath on sin. The side of the day of the Lord that the world should utterly fear. As Paul teaches us this morning, He's going to teach us on, on, and kind of show us both of these sides. And so he's going to break his teaching down kind of into two particular groups of people. Those that do not follow Christ and also those who do. And as we're going to soon see, the response of the day of the Lord will be quite different depending on which group of the people one might belong to. And so the first group that Paul begins to talk about those who we're going to start just talking about this morning, is those in the world who do not know and do not follow Christ. For those in the Thessalonian church, and many throughout the world today, this is a group of people who is going to actually include those who are persecuting them. This persecution, what they've been facing, has essentially been going on as we continue to read over and over again since the beginning of the church. But before we really kind of compare these two groups of people and how they respond to the day of the Lord, I think it's probably in our best interest to, to kind of understand what this phrase actually means. And so we first begin to hear about the day of the Lord all the way back in the prophecies of Amos. And this would have been some 800 years prior to the birth of Christ. And so when Amos speaks about this, this coming event, it's kind of pretty much the epitome of what we could call doom and gloom. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. And so Amos was a prophet in a time when those around him might have claimed to have followed God. Their actions, however, speak something completely and utterly different. So they believed in many ways that simply because they came from the line of Abraham, they could call themselves Israel, that this meant they were completely at peace with God. And this is, as we soon hear from the words of, of, of Amos, they're about as wrong as a human being could possibly be. They firmly believe that they're in the light. But Amos is going to claim that they're wrong. He points, points out rather boldly that they're not in the light. They're not children of light. But actually, they're children of darkness. And so fast forward about 800 years to the time when the Apostle Paul lived. As we're well aware, he is no longer surrounded by the people of Israel. Instead, he's writing to a new Gentile believers in the church. While his audience is different, while those he's actually talking about are, are, are different, his message is in many ways the exact same message. Those who are away from God should not be looking forward just at all to this great and mighty day of the Lord. And so Amos continues his just honestly startling imagery as he goes on to verse 10 of chapter 8 of his book. 
And in this, in this verse, he claims, it will be like a man who flees from a lion only to have a bear confront him. Then he then goes home to rest his hand against the wall only to have a snake bite him. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light, even gloomy, without any brightness in it? So I'd like this to stop right there this morning in our, in our reading of Amos. And I'd like this to have that just utterly dark imagery in our minds as we kind of transition back to the book of 1 Thessalonians. As we read, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. And so when Paul begins to speak of the day of the Lord, this isn't something that he's making up. The imagery, as we just saw, comes from many of the prophets of the Old Testament. Not only does he draw from their teaching, but he also draws from the teaching of Christ himself. And so turn, turn over with me to the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And so we're going to spend a few minutes looking at a passage in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 42. And so as Christ is talking about the second coming, we're going to read, Therefore be alert, since you don't know when the day of the Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, there's that thief imagery again, he would have stayed alert and no, not let his house be broken into. This is why you are to be ready. Because the Son of Man, Christ, is coming at an hour you do not expect. So in his description of the day of the Lord, Paul kind of gives us two distinct ways in which this is going to come through his imagery. And so we saw a bit earlier, and it was we just read, how he uses imagery from Jesus when he mentions that it's going to come like a thief in the night. It's one of my favorite book series. It contains one of the, one of the main characters, and he's a, he's a young teenage thief named Jimmy the Hand. And he's this cocky, cocky little teenager who believes that he's the best thief, kind of this in the entire city. And I think this passage reminds me of Jimmy. Because throughout this series... He's kind of able to steal from anyone at any time. He has this almost supernatural ability to strike. And the person he steals from, they're not going to know it for days. It doesn't matter if it was a common merchant or if it was the king. It was almost impossible to know when Jimmy would strike. And it's the same way for those who live in darkness. So the church in Thessalonica lived at a time in the Roman Empire it was considered the Pax Romana. So it was a time of great peace. It was great security. Kind of all throughout the empire. With all of its might. With all of its wealth and power behind it. They believed they were pretty much untouchable. And so in the age of postmodernism, much of those around us kind of believe the same thing. We might not believe in the, the power and the security of the Roman Empire, we might not even see that, that same kind of peace in the world around us. What many have done, however, is, is we've kind of become lulled into this almost false sense of security. We've told ourselves that there's no God. We've told ourselves that there's no moral law. And if you take those two out, that means there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, then there's no final reckoning and I can live however I want to live. And the second aspect of the day of the Lord that Paul speaks on is that it's completely unavoidable. Amos talked about it as we, as we read in a very similar way. Destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman. So a pregnant woman, one who was actually going to have a child, is ultimately going to have some type of labor pain. It might happen early. It might even happen later. But 
the baby is going to come, and it will probably be painful. So this is one thing, I kind of think this, thing, this, this one thing through with me this morning. You have this cosmic event. It's an event of destruction that can happen pretty much at any time. Not only that, there's no way you can get out of it. I think this is where the imagery from, from Amos is just so daunting. You might somehow, somehow, escape a lion. I'm not sure how, but we'll say it's possible. And then what do you do? You run straight into a bear. That's scary. But we'll go with this. You escape the lion, somehow you escape the bear, and you're able to run home. And you slam the door, and you think you're safe, you think you're, you're secure, and you kind of lean up against the wall, and what happens? You get bit by a snake. It's unavoidable. And so, I don't know about you, but I, I cannot at all picture anything darker than this, right? As, as, as Paul begins to, and continues to build on the prophecy of Amos, as he continues to build on the words of Christ himself, he paints this picture just of utter, utter darkness. And so this, it's, it's at this moment... It's at kind of this point of time where I can hear kind of the the words on the left. So for those of you who might be familiar with Marvel movies, then you're kind of going to know exactly what I'm talking about. So when all hope is lost, when you're just done, something comes out of almost completely nowhere and begins to save the day. And it's at this point in the narrative Paul begins to talk about those who do know Christ. And so after his explanation of those in darkness, he moves to those to, as Peter so wonderfully mentions, have moved from darkness into this marvelous light. And as funny as the word sounds, but can be one of the most beautiful words in the English language. At least it's beautiful in how Paul uses it as he begins verse 4 of chapter 5. So in these next few verses, Paul paints a beautiful picture about what it looks like to be this children of light. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you're all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. And so what does Paul actually mean when he begins to call them, as well as us, children of light? This is kind of a bit of a loaded question. And honestly, it could probably take a few sermons to to flesh it all out. But as, as followers of Christ, as those that know his teaching, who understand his teaching and want to to follow his teaching. They should be familiar with what is eventually going to happen in the world. So as you might recall, Paul began this section by pointing out some information about the times and the seasons of 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 the, the, the day of the Lord, the second coming. It's something that he taught was so important, and he thought was so important, that he thought taught this to the church just in that little short time that he had with them. So we do not, and we cannot, know when Christ will return. While he was on earth, Christ himself told us and taught us that even he didn't know when that final day would come. And yet, not knowing this day shouldn't actually matter. Why? Why? we know that no matter what day it is, no matter when this final day is, we know for absolute certainty that it will come. 
So Elijah, our sound man back there, who's hopefully not going to mute me right now as I, as I mention his name, he runs cross country, right? So each race that he runs begins the exact same way. After kind of a quick huddle with a, the referee or whatever you call him, kind of teaches you the rules, everyone who's running the race lines up on the line. It's kind of a beautiful sight. I, I love watching cross country starts. So it's at this point, right? You, you get on the line, you kind of stand there. You start to think through your head. You start to clear your head, right? You get your head clear. You can make, check your shoes, make sure your shoes aren't, you know, untied, because that's usually not a good thing to start a race with your shoes untied. So as you're, as you're doing this, right, you're making sure that you're ready. Okay? You might say a quick prayer. You, you stretch one final time. And then you hear a shout, on your mark, get set. And I want to stop right here for a second. You know what's going to come next, right? As a runner, just every fiber of your being goes tense, just waiting for that gun to go off. You know that it's going to go off. You're ready for it to go off, so you can finally just kind of take off. However, at this point, you know it's going to go off, but you still aren't sure exactly when that gun is going to go off. I think this is the imagery that Paul wants us as believers to see. As Christians, as children of the light, we should ultimately realize that we've been given this gift of grace, right? As Paul teaches, starting in verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, we may live together with him. You see, when we begin to compare these two groups, whether it's the saved or the unsaved, we can sometimes get a, big of a, a bit of a big head. We might start, start to see salvation. The salvation that we just talked about is something that we did or something we, we can do as compared to something that has been given to us. We might look at a passage like this that teaches us about the Christian life, and it might start to appear kind of as a checklist on how I'm going to earn my salvation. If I stay self-controlled, check. If I put on the armor of God, if I do this, this, and this, and this, this is how I receive salvation. This is how I, myself, Stay away from the wrath that is to come. Our actions almost try to become a, like a get-out-of-hell-free of, of card from Monopoly instead of what they actually are meant to be. But the beauty of this passage is the hope that it gives to those who no longer are going to face that future darkness. Just like the recipient, recipients of Amos' message those who are in, in darkness truly just don't understand how dark it actually is. So as we begin to understand this passage just a bit more fully this morning, we should begin to see that this, this isn't simply a message where Paul compares two groups of people. This comparison is simply the jumping off point for the real lessons he wants to teach us. And he wanted to teach those in his care. So beginning in verse 7, he kind of begins to explain to his audience what it actually means to not live in darkness, but to live in the light. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get, dr get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. So this is where Paul takes all of these taught so far and just kind of begins to really hammer out what he's wanting the Thessalonian church as well as us today to understand. So as those who follow Christ so those who were children of Christ, we're in the light. 
as the light. What does Paul teach us? What we must do. He teaches us the exact same thing that the other apostles taught. So turn with me over for, for just a second to, to 1 John for a moment. And so, so we're going to look at, specifically look at chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. I'll give you just a few seconds to turn over there along with me. So this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, what we do in life actually does matter. As we look at a passage like ours today that speaks about both self-control or it speaks about faith and love, we can kind of look at these passages in a, a number of different ways. For one, we can look at a passage like this in 1 Thessalonians, where you can look at, look at one, the, the one we just read from 1 John, and believe that our actions kind of are what lead us to salvation. As I mentioned before, if if, if only I do this, and this, and this, I'm going to be good enough to earn my way to heaven. The problem with this idea is that we would end up being in a a kind of a similar spot to those who the prophet Amos was, was prophesying to. We believe that we're in God's good graces, kind of based on who we are, or what we have done, and that's not the case. We cannot ever do good enough to earn God's salvation. Instead, our best works are just simply good enough to face the wrath and that judgment of God. We could also look at a passage like this and and kind of take it the complete opposite way. We might indeed see that I'm solely reliant, not on myself, but on the grace and the mercy of God. So if this grace and if this mercy of God is a free gift, if I'm saved no matter how bad I sin, then kind of who cares what I do with my future, right? This idea that is, is something that also, Paul also squashes just all throughout his letters. But as we read in our passage today, our, our actions don't earn us salvation. But they are indeed the, the, the result of that salvation. Through the mercy of God, He has called us out of darkness, out of the sin that holds on to us, and has called us into the light. As we step into this light, as it washes away our sins, and as it begins to change us, not just on the outside, but from the inside out, there should begin to be a difference in our lives. So this is why Paul was able to to end this section today Kind of with both the, the affirmation and yet more of a call, right? Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. And so as Christians, we know where this world is going. We aren't going to be shocked one day when Christ does return. If I'm having a bad day at work, what should my, this, this cause my reaction to actually be? Should not be definitely not be throwing a pencil, but to remember where Christ is leading all this. If I see one of my Christian brothers or my Christian sisters struggling, how do we begin to build each other up? The answer is not with you know the the, the pithy sayings and just the kind of the Christian cliches that we we like to throw around. 
but to point them forward to where all this is leading us. Christ will return. His return isn't just maybe a 50-50 chance, but something that's been in the works since before the beginning of time. It's an event that will take place, and it's one that we as believers should be ready for. We should be ready for this moment at all times. This means that our lives should probably follow the teachings and the commands, not of ourselves, but of the one we truly love, the one who died on the cross to save us from this coming wrath. This isn't just a solitary kind of individual command either, but one that we can help our fellow church members through as the ages pass. And so as believers, however, we shouldn't be the only ones who know about the second coming of Christ. This isn't a secret. It's not something we just kind of hold on to and hide. So as I said before, what is it? Well, it's our greatest hope. It's our greatest glory. It will not be so for those who do not know Christ. I can't even imagine the terror and the heartache and just the horror that will one day occur at the second coming of Christ. To believe that you're safe, to believe that you're secure in your own world, and then to one day wake up and face the wrath and the judgment of the sovereign Lord of the universe, that just, it's a terrible thing to behold. And so church, I'm going to ask us a question. How do we share this knowledge with those around us? How do we warn them about this coming judgment? Since we live in a world that loves to shout, loves to fight, just be on, on Facebook for about five minutes and you'll see that. And sometimes fighting is the answer. But I want to keep, keep going and, and ask this other question. So what does the world see when it actually does hear the church speak about the second coming of Christ? Does it see a church who, who actually cares for them? He was calling them to repentance because it loves them. And it truly wants to see them saved. Or does it see a church who's simply checking off the box? It doesn't actually care for our neighbors or family. Or even those who persecute us has a chance to come to Christ. And so this topic isn't something abstract for Paul. It isn't something that he, he read about in a textbook. And it's just kind of, kind of pondering for the fun of it. It's something that truly, truly matters to him. All throughout the New Testament, you can see how much Paul loved people. It didn't matter if they were Jewish like himself, or if it was a, like a, a gent, Gentile Roman guard in, in Rome. He wanted them above all else to hear the gospel. He wanted them all above all else to hear the love and the mercy of Christ. So we must remember that Paul, just like each of us, was on the other side of this at one point in time. Paul was even actually a persecutor of the church, right? He had Christians persecuted and killed, all because he believed at one point rather strongly that Christ was not who he claimed to be. He had looked judgment square in the face. And yet it was only through the mercy and the grace of God while Paul was traveling on the road to Damascus that brought him from darkness into this marvelous light. See, he understood that the wrath and the judgment of God is just. It's necessary because God is holy. But it doesn't stop him from sharing the gospel with those who are even persecuting him. 
In fact, this should push us harder and harder because we know, just as Paul knows, what is eventually going to happen. And so as a church, we can take great encouragement from a passage like this. It should push us to understand what it truly means not to love ourselves, but to love one another and to encourage each other and to build one another up. Not in ourselves, but in the Lord. We can learn to help each other to repentance. We can call each other to repentance. And we can call each other to, to ever and ever and ever be growing in the faith. So it helps us to truly learn what love and faith are. So we grow in each every single day. It should also cause us as a church to, to be able to reach into our community. Not with a hateful judgment, but as a loving warning of what is to come one day. It isn't something that we can simply water down or sweep under the rug. As the prophet Amos teaches us, the judgment of God, the day of the Lord, is not something that the world should be looking forward to without Christ. And yet as followers of Christ, we can invite them to, into this love and the mercy of this one true king who is the sovereign Lord of the universe. 